morning, friends. Bless the Lord. We're going to open in a word of prayer. We'd invite you if you'd like to join us around the front of the auditorium for just a moment as we take a, this moment and just commit our time and our service to the Lord and His direction. And we'll pray as we do every week for another church in our community and one of our churches in Panama. I want to pray for Pastor Sonia. She's been ill and in the hospital again. We we'll pray for our friends in, in Ukraine, our monthly supported missionaries, church families. We'll pray for the Browns. Uh, Gary had a, a week full of COVID issues, and Jan has been ill, although she hasn't had that uh, positive test. So we'll pray for them as we get started as well. Lord, we just thank you for your faithfulness in our lives and the opportunity today to, to be together, to worship you, and to uh, uh, encourage one another, Lord, to learn from your word together. This, we just invite you to come in and speak to our hearts have your way in each life and each heart today, God, that you'll just draw us closer to you to, to better be able to reflect Christ to the world around us. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, this morning for Pastor Schultz and Faith United Methodist Church as, as he and his family settle in and, and uh, connect with the community and, and begin uh, regular ministry at uh, Faith Methodist. Lord, we just pray for a blessing on that time of of transition and uh, for the church that you will encourage them as a body of believers and, and as they uh, reach out into our community Lord we just pray your favor and your blessing and your encouragement on them we pray as well for our churches in Panama we think of the San Blas campus this morning and pray God that you will just uh, continue to use them and that their service today and their community would be marked with your presence with your power with your grace that people will come to know Christ and find hope in Jesus. We pray for uh, Pastor Sonia today. We pray for health and healing in her body. Uh, strengthen and encourage her today, Lord, that she will feel your presence and know your touch. And we think of our friends in Ukraine and all that continues to happen there with the war. Lord, that it will bring an end to that uh, invasion, that their peace could settle on that country. <clears throat> we pray for uh, Pastors Anya and Galena as they lead their churches and the church prays. Across the country, we pray your blessing and direction, Lord, as they interact with and, and bring help and, and hope to uh, villages that have been uh, in, in battle zones. And God, that you know all of those things. We're for your protection, your safety. And uh, Lord, we pray for our missionaries today. We think of the Petersons and their work with the Japanese speaking people here in Minnesota. Uh, Lord, that you will just uh, give favor there and, and open more opportunities and, and lives to the truth of your gospel. That as, as people travel back and forth between Minnesota and Japan, that the message of Christ will travel with them. And we just pray your blessing and your favor of the Petersons as they continue that ministry. And we think of Steph Peterson and her work with the Chi Alpha Ministries at Winona State. Uh, God, that this would just be another powerful school year marked with your presence, with students coming to Christ, being filled with your spirit, called to ministry, called to, to the ministering in a variety of places and, and, and contexts that you will use them. In. And uh, we just pray your strength and blessing on that ministry at Winona. And we pray for the Browns today, Lord, and just for strength and health in their bodies as uh, they just continue to recover and, and uh, that you will minister to them today, that they will feel your presence, know your grace at work in their lives. We pray for the Piantex as they're traveling to see kids and grandkids. Lord, we just pray your blessing on their travels for safe travel. We pray, Lord, that, uh, that they will feel and know your presence today as uh, they worship together with one of their sons and uh, God that you'll just bless and encourage them and uh, Lord we think of Israel today and all that's happening in that region and we pray Lord your protection over the people of Israel we think of the people in the Gaza Strip Lord as well many many very innocent people that are caught up in the midst of this battle this war and we pray for your protection over their lives and uh, that in the midst of this, that the message of Christ could be proclaimed both in Israel and in, in the Palestinian areas. Uh, Lord, that people will be hearing of your goodness, of your grace, and that they, they can come to know Jesus in the midst of this war. And we pray your, your peace. We pray peace will settle on that region and uh, that you'll be glorified. And again, Lord, we just uh, we want to commit our time, our service to you for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We just encourage you as you, uh, as the worship team leads us this morning, whether you're watching online or here in the sanctuary, that you join with us in song and worship the Lord. We will. 
And Lord, I take that prayer to everybody with a dark soul over there to take them and fill their dark soul with your light as you are protecting the Christians and the other people around there, Lord. But take those dark souls. As we speak, their eyes will be opened, their hearts will be transformed, Lord. That spiritual battle that's going, Lord, we know you are in the works. Lord, there will be you to reign in the end of this. Lord, dark souls will come to light. In Jesus' name. Amen. thank you thank you that you loved each one of us enough that you sent your son that you came to die for us so that we could have life so that we would not need to live in fear so that we could know you personally know that you are always with us Even now, your spirit's tugging at the hearts of, of others, saying, I love you. God, that they might respond to that love today and say, I don't understand it, but I accept it. May we all sense your love today, Father. be aware that it's there for us all the time that you love us you don't always like the choices that we make but you still love us and you're always drawing us to you may we fall in love with you just as much as you love us
That we thank you that you, you love us so desperately much. That your heart is that, that we would all come to repentance, that none would perish in, in eternal flames of, of hell, but you provide a way for us out, and, and you have made the way through your own life, through your own sacrifice on the cross. And God, that you would, you would empower us to be the voice of hope that our neighbors and coworkers and class worker, classmates need to know about you and, and that we can have eternity with you rather than eternity in hell. When I think of the, the billion people that live in China today, so very many of them have never once heard the name of Jesus. And we pray for our missionaries who are there and, and believers that are there, that as they share their faith, as they share the good news of Christ, that, that others across China will be caught up with the one who loves them desperately, who's made a way for them to know forgiveness of sin and eternal life in your presence. I pray for the service at the prison tonight. God, I pray that as we share the word that uh, there will be ladies who will hear and receive that message of hope. That there is one who loves them, who has made a way for them to have forgiveness and that they will turn their lives to you and trust in you tonight. We just thank you, God, that you are faithful to reach out to us, to call out to us, to make way for us, to, to find someone that that knows you, that can share that message with us. God, thank you. We give you glory and honor, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. You can be seated. So there's a billion people in China. About a, year, a, little, over, a little over a year ago, India surpassed China as the most populated continent, country in the world. But there's still a billion people there. <laughs> And it's estimated that there's maybe 100 million Christians in China, um, but, but there's a billion people there, and the vast majority have never heard about Jesus. And uh, for years, we've heard about how the government has suppressed the Christian message, and churches have been underground, and, and uh, sometimes we think about the, the persecution. I, I shared with a group of teenagers last night up at Maplewood Park as a Congregational Church had their Bible smuggling event, the annual event that they've done, and they wanted me to come and talk about persecuted church, and I was thinking about China and all that has happened there and the way they've persecuted the church, trying to shut the light out, and an amazing thing has happened is 100 billion people have come to know Jesus. <laughs> and, and as much as the enemy tries to put out the light, John told us the light came into the world and darkness could not overcome. So we got a little missions report. It's our missions month. I know we had missionaries last week. We showed a little missions video last week challenging us to faith promises. And I would encourage you to be praying about making a faith promise for missions for the next calendar year from January to December of next year. 
Um, but this, this report out of China would just so encourage me this week what God is doing there and, and uh, the work that our missionaries are involved in. I want us to see that this morning. I'll come back in just a minute then and we'll make the, some announcements. We'll receive the offering. Let's watch that video. Today, we're looking at a nation that's really vastly different than it was even five years ago where there's just been a continual opening of the government and the society to the gospel. Our missionaries doing things we never dreamt they would ever be able to do inside a communist People's Republic of China. We still have opportunity, but the political climate in Northern Asia is changing. And we have to recognize that and we have to make adjustments. But the fact is, even with the changes we're seeing, we've had no missionaries uh, expelled from China. Uh, we have businesses, missions that are running in the nation and doing well, some of them even in the absence of, of uh, their American uh, you know, missionary leaders. Is the church in China now a persecuted church again? I would not say that. I would in no way say the church in China is persecuted. Hey, they're still growing. They're still planting churches. They're still training leaders. They're still sending missionaries to other nations. But it is a church that's finding some new challenges. They've had to go to smaller groups within their uh, house church networks. They're not meeting in as large groups as they once were. They're having to divide up more. They're having to find new locations to meet. But they're finding answers to their struggles. What we're asking the Lord for is to speak to us supernaturally with a prophetic voice. Thus saith the Lord, a word from God, how we move forward. I believe God's going to give that to us. I believe he's going to lead us. He's done it so well, all the way to the present. There's no doubt in my mind he won't continue to do that. Praise God. Isn't that exciting? Uh, that the word of God just moves forward. We need workers. But the Word of God is, just continues to move forward, and that's just a tremendous thing. I'm going to ask our ushers to come, and they're going to receive the offering this morning, tithe and offerings. And uh, as they come, I'm going to just read a uh, little passage from Scripture, and then we'll make some announcements as the offering is being received. In Genesis chapter 14, it's starting in verse 17, it says, After Abraham returned from defeating Kedlomar, and the kings uh, allied with him, and the king of Sodom and king, Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shavah, that is the king's valley. And then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was a priest of the Most High God. And he blessed Abram and said, Blessed Abram, be blessed, Abram, by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise the God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hands. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. King of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and the goods for yourselves. And then the story continues there. But the interesting thing is, this was just in Abram's heart. He had won this tremendous battle and all the spoils and all the goods that come with winning a battle in those days and that age in a, in a war and all of it was his. And God put it in his heart as he met the priest of God, Melchizedek. I need to give a tenth of this to the priest as an offering to God. And that's where, that's kind of where it all begins. God called for Ab Cain and Abel gave offerings. But here it is now, uh, as, as Abram puts it in his heart, it wasn't a requirement of God, it wasn't anything. He says, I just want to give a portion of it, what God has entrusted to me back to him. And uh, that's the model that we have in paying tithe and giving offerings and being a part of the work of the kingdom around the world. Lord, we just pray that as we pay our tithe this morning, as we give in offerings today, that you will uh, work in us, work through us, and that you will bless and extend the, the impact of these dollars that we invest in your kingdom, that they will go further than we could imagine and make a greater impact than we ever thought possible. And that we commit it to you and for your honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. So these were these uh, 
faith promise cards are in the bulletins last week. There are some on the table inside the front door. If you didn't get one last week or maybe you've misplaced it and you're not sure where it is, I would encourage you to, to have one of those to pray over that and, and uh, let the Lord guide you and direct you in how you would give to missions over the next year. And, uh, and that will help our missionaries. You can see in the wall heading out to the fellowship hall on the missionaries that we support, support on a monthly basis. And we're, we count on those uh, faith promise commitments and offerings as they come in to be able to pay those uh, missionaries as they're out doing the work of the kingdom in various places around the world. A couple other announcements that we just want to <clears throat> be aware of. We've got a Friday night prayer time coming up this Friday night uh, at 7 o'clock here in the sanctuary. We'd love to have you come out and pray with us. Um, and then kind of something that's a little bit special, um, the pastor from the, <clears throat> excuse me, from the First Congregational Church talked to me a couple weeks ago, and he said, hey, um, I know you guys baptized by immersion, and I'm pretty sure you have a baptismal tank at your church. And he said, our faith tradition is to baptize infants. And we, we sprinkle them with water, and, and we do that as, as small kids. But I, but I have some people in my church, a couple, three people, that would really love to be baptized as adults. They'd really love to be immersed. And we don't have a place to do that. And we'd really like it to be kind of a little bit more of a public setting. And is there a chance that you guys have a baptismal service planned that we could come and be a part of? <laughs> and I said, man, we don't, but we can. <laughs> and so I've been kind of asking around, and I remembered a month or so, two ago, maybe three months ago, uh, Landon. Landon came to me on his way out of church one Sunday, and he said to me, the next time I'm getting baptized. <laughs> and that kind of just kind of started ringing back in my ears. So I reached out to his mom this, this week, and I said, what's the chances Landon's still interested in being baptized? And uh, we want to do this service. And so the plan is we're going to, he, and he's going to get baptized. I'm excited about that. And maybe you haven't been baptized yet and you should be baptized. Follow the lead of this mighty warrior Landon into the waters of baptism. Uh, we're going to do it on the last Sunday of the month, the 29th. And if you haven't been baptized, if you haven't been immersed in baptism, I would encourage you to do that. Talk to me and I'd love to help you get in that process and we'll plan for that. And, but though it's going to be a little different for us than some of our other baptisms because we have another church that's going to join us. And they have church pretty much the same time we do. So our plan is we should eat together. <laughs> and we'll have our regular service. They'll have their regular service. And then we're going to plan to have a potluck dinner at 1130 on that day. And they're going to come and join us. As soon as their service is done, they're coming over here. And they're going to join us for a potluck dinner. And then about 12.30, 12.45, we'll come from the fellowship hall back into the sanctuary and we'll have baptism. And there people can be a part of that and land in and maybe others from here can be a part of that. And it's going to be a great day in the kingdom of God as people follow Jesus in obedience and, and fullness of God's plan and get baptized. And so that's that. Um, I think there's a sign-up sheet now for our, we're hosting for the Ministerial Association this year, the Thanksgiving dinner, and we're going to be hosting it physically even at our church, at our building. And so the information is kind of getting out, disseminated to the community, but we need people who can help us that day. We need people that can uh, help deliver to home deliveries. We need people to help package up those home delivery things. And then there will be some that are going to come to take carry out. We're going to have packages for the carry out people and people out on the sidewalk to make sure they get their carry out thing to take home with them. And then we're going to need people to help us with setting up and cleaning up and, and serving meals and visiting with those who will come and sit down and have a meal. And so we're going to need a lot of people to help us out on Thanksgiving Day. And I know that it's Thanksgiving Day. But sometimes, sometimes we just have to do a little bit more to show the love of God. And so I'm asking you if you'll do that, join us and uh, sign up and be a part of that. It, it, whatever segment that you feel most comfortable in, there's a lot of areas that can happen in, and we just appreciate your help with that. Ladies, there's information still in the bulletin today about the Thrive Conference for next year. And you can sign up through Tuesday morning. And if you haven't been to the Thrive Conference, the Fall Women's Ministries Conference over in Rochester before, you can sign up and go for $10 next year. That's a tremendous deal. If you want uh, more specifics on that, you can talk to Gail and she can help you with that. And uh, she'd be excited to be able to do that. So we're going to let our kids, ages 3 through 6th grade, be dismissed to go to junior church, to children's church. Sue's got a missions lesson for them today. And uh, that's going to be an exciting time back there as they're learning about missions. 
And we're going we're gonna to get back to, as you can see, we're going to get back to our series, uh, He Gets Us. And uh, one night this week, we were watching something on TV, and I was uh, working on, on sending the devotional out to the prison, and Gail said, hey, hey. <laughs> and I looked up, and there was the end of a He Gets Us commercial in the middle of the baseball game. Uh, and that was, that was fun to see. The, I saw just the end of it, so I'm not even sure the full message of that particular commercial. But they're out there. They're, they're getting the message out. It's great to see it in, in all of those contexts. And uh, so we're pulling from that, uh, that series of commercials and information they're putting out just to plant the seed in people's hearts and lives that God gets you. He understands you. And He wants more than to get you. He wants to have relationship with you. And so we're going to get back into that today, and uh, this is our, our fourth message in this series. If you haven't been here for the first three, uh, I'd encourage you, if you didn't, haven't heard those, maybe you want to go to our podcast thing, you can find it on iTunes, or you can find it on, a, on our, our regular channel there as well, or you could listen through our, our church, fa- uh, uh, what, is it, what do we call it, a web page, that's what we call it, man, I'm just telling you, so there's a lot of places you could listen to those messages, and I would encourage you to do that, we talked the first week about the remarkable compassion of Jesus, the next week we talked about the outrageous kindness of Jesus, and isn't it good that he has an outrageous kindness towards you and me, and uh, then we talked about Jesus' refreshing response to anxiety, I had a pastor from Africa email me this week, and he said, I found your web page, and I was listening to that message that you preached about the refreshing response to anxiety. And I just want you to know, I'm preaching that in my church this week. <laughs> he said, that just, that just spoke to my heart, and I took notes. I listened to it a couple times, that I'm preaching that for my people, because there's people in my country and my people that need to understand that God loves them beyond the anxiety and can help wash that out of their lives. So what a, what a great thing. So today as we get back into this series, we're going to be talking about and looking at the radical acceptance of Jesus. And in Jesus' day, uh, for many of the religious leaders, they thought that he was a bit of a rebel because he accepted people that shouldn't be accepted. <laughs> he loved people that just shouldn't be loved. He loved the outsiders and he accepted them. And, and that got him into a lot of conflict. And so we'll be looking through some of that this morning. That, that radical acceptance of Jesus, the truth is, it has never gone over well in religious circles. Isn't that an amazing thought? The radical acceptance of Jesus has never gone over well in religious circles. It didn't go over well in his, the day that he lived and walked on earth, and it hasn't gone over well in religious circles any time since then, not even today. And so if we're going to be a disciple of Jesus, the truth is that we too must learn to go out on a limb and accept people most others will not. We go out and we accept them and we show them love and we offer them grace and mercy. Chuck Swindoll told a story, I want to share it with you, about a little boy named Chad. Chad was a very shy little boy. One afternoon late in January, Chad told his mom, he said, Mom, I want to make a valentine for each kid in my, in my classroom at school. And, and his mom said, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, Chad, honey, I wish, I wish you wouldn't do that. She knew that the children simply ignored little Chad. Her Chad was always behind everybody else when they walked home from school. He was never included in the things of the classroom or the playground or any place else. Nevertheless, she decided that she was going to help Chad make valentines. She bought some construction paper and glue and crayons, and for three weeks, night after night, Chad sat at the kitchen table and made 35 valentines all by hand. When Valentine's Day arrived, Chad was so excited. His mom was very fearful of the disappointment that he he was likely going to receive if he didn't get any valentines that day. She told Chad that she would have his favorite cookies baked and ready when he came home from school that day, thinking maybe some fresh hot cookies will ease the pain of probably not getting any Valentines. That afternoon, the kids were were later at coming up the street than they normally were, and Chad's mom had the cookies and the milk out on the table, 
She finally heard the kids coming up the sidewalk laughing and talking with one another. And as usual, there was Chad at the far end of the line of kids walking up the sidewalk. She thought for sure he was going to burst into tears as soon as he walked in the front door. His arms were empty. She noticed when he opened the door, as she's choking back tears, realizing that meant he didn't get any Valentines today. She says, Chad, honey, mommy has some warm cookies and milk for you. He didn't even look up at her. He didn't respond. He just marched right, sta- right past her and he sat down at the table, crossed his arms, and he said, not a one. Not a single one. And her heart sank as she's prepared to cry with her little son. And then he stopped and he looked up at her and he said, I didn't forget a single kid in my class. <laughs> That, that incredible little story of Chad's care for the others is meant to encourage you and me. Because we can also identify what Chad's experience in the memories can be painful for us. We all know what it's like to not get a Valentine or to not be invited to a birthday party or to not be chosen to be on the team or to not be invited to join the club or the social group or all of those things, few of us naturally respond the way Chad did because we don't like it when we aren't included. We desperately want to be accepted by other people. And guess what, friends? Jesus gets us. Jesus gets us. He knows. He knows what it was like to not be accepted. He knows what it was like to be rejected, to be forgotten, He is the God who made us, who reaches out to the marginalized. He sees the outcast. He identifies with the forgotten, and he calls sinners to relationship. And he's made a way for all of us to know him. And this means we can can and should affirm all people as created in God's image and being worthy of love, all without endorsing any given ideology or Belief on a certain topic doesn't matter with the religious background. It doesn't matter all of those things. They're still created in God's image, right? All of us are. And worthy of, of love and acceptance. And we can point those folks to Jesus who died for sinners just like them and just like you and me. In the New Testament days, the problem was The Pharisees. The Pharisees, if you're not sure what that really means, they are some of the religious leaders of that day. And the Pharisees of Jesus' day in the New Testament days only accepted their kind of people. And that really led to a lot of conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees because Jesus accepted, as a rebel would, people that didn't fit their criteria of acceptance. One commentator observed it this way. He said, Jesus and the early church were often criticized for associating with undesirable characters. And Mark, as he wrote his gospel, justified Jesus' practice by showing how he changed the lives of such people. You see, friends, Jesus gets us. He gets how people create layers that treat others wrongly. He gets how we easily choose to look at others as if we are in some way superior to them. And yet, He loves us. And He calls us to follow Him. And that means radical acceptance. Let's pray, and then we'll jump into the depths of this message. Lord, just help us to hear from You today. As we look at Scripture, as we understand that You get us, You you understand, and You want us to to respond as Jesus would respond to those around us. God, thank you for accepting us when others wouldn't. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we're going to briefly touch on four different accounts as we look through this and think about this radical acceptance of Jesus the first one we're going to touch on is found in John chapter 4, and it's, it's, we're going to talk about Jesus reaching out to the marginalized, and, and if you're familiar with John 4, you know that that early part of that chapter, much of that chapter, is about Jesus' encounter with a Samaritan woman at the well. 
So we're going to pick that up a little bit into the story. You're going to start at verse 7 and, uh, and read down a little bit, a little ways from there in the midst of this story. Verse 7 says, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to Jesus, You're a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw this water. So here in John 4, we, we read that Jesus had to go to Samaria in verse 4, just before where we started reading. It's talking about Jesus had to go to Samaria, and he's weary from the journey, and he waits outside of the little village that's there, up, up on a hillside where, where uh, his disciples leave him there by this well, and the disciples head off looking for food. And in the process of him sitting there resting and the disciples looking for water, this Samaritan woman comes out to the well. She was considered by, by everyone, I think even today, everyone who's ever heard this story, and especially the people in her lifetime, she was considered marginalized in multiple ways. Samaritans were already marginalized by the Jews. They, they were a half-breed kind of people that, that kind of mixed the religion of the Jews with other religions, and there were a lot of things. So as a people group, the Samaritans were marginalized. But she was also a woman. And to make matters worse, for her, she had four failed marriages. And she was currently living with a man who wasn't her husband. And you see all that in verses 16 to 18. She was an outcast, so much so that, that she couldn't even go get water at the normal cooler time of the day because of the shame that she lived in. Very marginalized woman. By society standards, she already had three strikes against her. She was a female, she was immoral, and she was a Samaritan. Strike three and you're out, right? I mean, we just the baseball playoffs are still going. But, but that's not true with Jesus. And isn't that good news? It's not true with Jesus. Instead, Jesus initiated a conversation with this woman, and it shocked her. But Jesus did, it, did even more. He asked her for help. Can you imagine the shock that resonated in her body when, first of all, he began to speak with her, but then he says... Will you give me a drink of water? <laughs> he asked for her help. And before the encounter was over, this unnamed Samaritan woman found what she truly sought in life. She found living water. From this encounter, this marginalized woman, something incredibly amazing happened. The marginalized instantly became a missionary. What an incredible thought. John chapter 4, verse 39, as we slide down that chapter, it says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He, did it. he told me everything I ever did. How do you understand the mission of the church? There's three, three common ways that people typically perceive, perceive the church's mission. The first one goes something like this. Some churches and Christians believe that our church as a mission, our mission as a church is to evade the culture. The Bible teaches that believers are to, to be separate from the world. We see that in 1 Peter chapter 2. But this, this separateness from the world doesn't contradict the Lord's command to impact the culture with the gospel. 
those that, that seek to evade the culture basically do it for one of two reasons. First, for some, they evade culture out of a fear of that the worldliness is somehow going to creep into their Christianity, or they have a fear of danger in the world, and some of those kinds of things. The second big reason is that some are simply not interested in reaching or impacting the world. Now, there's a second way that many churches will approach this mission of the church business, and, and it's this. Some Christians will seek to pervade the world. They are they're battlers who seek to overpower the culture by might, be it political or social or economic. They draw the line between the good guys and the bad guys and the churched and the unchurched. However, if we read Ephesians 6, the fundamental battle that we have is not between the unchurched and the church. It is between the forces of God and the forces of evil. It's a spiritual battle, not a physical battle. So there's this third way that many see the mission in, of the church in engagement, and it's this way. The, the biblical church engages the world. Yes, it's true, Jesus' followers should flee from sin. We're told that very point blank in Scripture. Flee from sin. And we should steward our influence in the world well. However, the church is not designed and intended to be a bomb shelter. It is supposed to be a gospel outpost. Where we come in and get resupplied and we go back out to battle the spiritual forces to open people's hearts and lives to the message of Christ. The best a church can be is to be like Jesus. So Jesus engaged the world through his incarnation. He could have engaged the world in other ways, but he felt the best way to engage the world was to become one of us. And the church, we engage the world, not so that we can become like the world, but so that the world can become like Jesus. So the second thing, the second story we're going to uh, look at this morning is that Jesus sees the outcast. We pick that up in Luke chapter 17. And again, we're, we're not reading the whole story, but Luke 17, starting at verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them... He said, go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Outcast and marginalized. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. In this encounter, <clears throat> Jesus is on the road when he encounters these, these ten lepers. And as we learn from the passage, lepers and from scriptures, lepers were socially and religious outcasts because of their disease. Now you can remember with me just a couple of years ago, and it's still happening at some level today, the global pandemic, the COVID thing, brought to our attention things like quarantines and social distancing and wearing masks. But separation for health goes all the way back at least as far as the book of Leviticus. In the, very, in the 13th chapter, we read about this social distancing and separation piece. People with leprosy had to follow some very specific guidelines. They were required to tear their clothing, to identify themselves, uh, their quarantine state, and that, that they had, didn't have to, to, to walk a certain direction in the aisle. You know, you go to the grocery store and the arrow says you have to walk this way. They didn't have to do that. Wasn't that a great thing? Partly because they couldn't go to the store. Because their social distancing was, as soon as you see somebody, you start screaming, unclean, unclean. If anyone came near them or even walked in their direction. 
They were to cry out unclean. And these ten lepers cried more than unclean when they recognized that it was Jesus in the distance. They cried out, Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus, help us. They cried for mercy. What about the, the so-called outcasts in our community? When they are suffering and in need of mercy is is our church, is the church at a whole in a place that they can turn to. In verse 14 of this passage, Jesus, it says, He saw them. Isn't that a beautiful thing? He saw them. Friends, He sees all of us. In our loneliness, in our anxiety, in all of the things that tag onto our He sees us. And in the same way, he sees us when we cry to Him, whether we're, it's because of disease or brokenness or sin wreckedness or poorness. He sees lepers ostracized from their community, and He sees you and me as well. Jesus told the lepers to go and show themselves to the priests, and they simply obeyed His words, and they were miraculously healed of their leprosy. These, these ten lepers who knew all too well what it meant to be separated, stigmatized, and traumatized by their illness were suddenly healed. Now only one stood out, verses 15 and 16. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice, throwing himself at Jesus' feet and thanked Him. The one leper who showed gratitude. Luke takes Special care to point out also was a Samaritan. He went from unclean to have mercy to praising and glorifying God all in a few moments. What an incredible spot. Friend, you may not have been healed from leprosy, but if you know Jesus, you've been cleansed of a deeper sin, of a deeper stain than leprosy, the stain of guilt. Without Jesus, we remain separated by something far more horrible than leprosy. Instead of a skin disease, we have a sin disease. But we too, we can cry, Jesus, have mercy on me. Because of Jesus' work on the cross, we, we find forgiveness. We find cleansing and new life. And in the same way, we are to show mercy to those around us. No matter how much of an outcast they may seem to be, we're called to show mercy. You see, Jesus gets us. He gets how, how people create layers that, that treat others wrongly. He gets how we easily choose to look at others as if we are in some way superior. And amazingly, He loves us. And he invites us to trust him and to do as he does. Now there's a third account in this piece that we're going to look at. It's another short story. Jesus identifies with the forgotten. I'll pick it up in Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to start at verse 31. Jesus describes the future when God will restore all things as he's teaching here. And in verse 31 he says, When the Son of Man comes in all his glory... And the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, and the, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. As Jesus is looking at those who will experience all the blessings of the kingdom, he continues, he's looking at those that, and, and that are thinking they're sheep, and he says this in verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the beginning, or since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? 
And the king replied, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Jesus identifies with those the world forgets. The ones living in poverty, the outcasts with no friends, the naked and the sick, the prison inmate, and his followers do the same. Now, I'll give you just a quick moment of true confession. I never wanted to do prison ministry. <laughs> when I first came here, the first about, a, about a six or eight months into being here, Pastor Mike was the chaplain at the prison, and he said, you should come to the prison with me and, and preach. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. I, I, those, it was a men's facility. I said, no, th th those guys are there for a reason. <laughs> I, you're there as a chaplain. I don't, I know. I don't, and, and he, the only way I could describe it is he bullied me for about a year and a half. <laughs> every time we had coffee, every time we had a conversation, he was telling me how desperately I needed to come to the prison to do some ministry. And I kept saying no. And then one day in a prayer time, the Lord said, what about the least of these? What are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about the outcasts? What are you going to do about those guys? And then I went. And now, 20 years later, <laughs> almost 20 years later, I'm still going into the prison. Last Sunday afternoon, I watched a little segment of a video out of north central Mexico. Olga is her name. She'd been a prison inmate, came to Jesus. I got to baptize her in water. I remember that day. 32 women got baptized that day. Olga got out of prison and was deported back to Mexico. And she did what we told her to do, find a church and go to church. The church she found was the pastor was a widower. And he thought she was kind of cute. <laughs> and they got married. And I was watching their church service last Sunday. I watched only a few minutes of it as they finished up the message, and then they walked out to this pool where 20-some people got baptized. <laughs> you know, there are times we look at people and we just think, you know, they, they, they got what they deserve. But God says, no, 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 what they deserve is my forgiveness. What they deserve is my grace. What they deserve is my mercy. What they deserve is eternal life with me. And I need you to go and help them to see that. And I don't, I, you know, I didn't even want to be there. Is that's certainly not about me, but it's about God saying, listen, I need you to get my heart on this. I need you to see the outcasts. I need you to see the lost and hurting the way that I see them. If we identify with Jesus as his followers, we too, friends, are to show this compassion as the prophet Zechariah wrote. And this is, our, this is our verse of the week, or verses of the week, if you will. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. Praise be to God. We can do that. We can live that out. So the last one we're going to touch on this morning is Jesus calls sinners into service. And we're going to be talking about Levi, sometimes called Matthew. He wrote one of the Gospels. And we're going to look at, at Levi's story in Matthew, or excuse me, in Luke chapter 5. I'm going to pick it up in verse 29. It says, Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to the disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, not the disciples, they were complaining to the disciples, but Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Levi, and as I said, called Matthew, is, is a tax collector. Tax collectors generally couldn't be trusted in the New Testament era. They couldn't be trusted. They were known as con men who extorted people's money. And Levi was a traitor because he was a Jew, and by choice, he was working for the Romans as a tax collector. In their culture, in their time, tax collectors were excluded from being witnesses or judges in court because they could not be trusted. Wow, How, talk about being excluded, talking about the whole thing. 
And a Jew like Levi would also be excommunicated from the going to the synagogue or to the temple. But the Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees and, their, and the scribes, they didn't see the potential in Levi that Jesus saw. The religious leaders only saw Levi in his role as a tax collector and wrongly judged him as a useless, even harmful sinner. Jesus saw a man who could be one of the 12 disciples, one who would write the first gospel in the New Testament, as we have it today. And he called Levi forward into that potential. Jesus saw Olga in the prison <laughs> in Wasika and called her forward to pastor a church in North Central Mexico. He saw Sonia in the prison in Wasika and called her forward to pastor a church in Panama. And he saw the lady that I can't, I, her, her, Persia, that's what we knew her as, Persia. He saw Persia from Iran in the prison and called her forward. And now she's a part of an underground church in in the capital city that runs over 20,000 people. He saw them in what we would think of, you know, they, they got what they deserve. They should be there. We, we, they're the outcasts. And he sees the potential in them and calls them into that potential. A person with a serious disease must recognize that they have a problem before they will ever go to the doctor. How many times, men, <laughs> have you had an issue and before you ever think about even calling the doctor, you've got to be where you can't get out of bed anymore. Maybe, maybe since I can't walk anymore, I should try to call the doctor and see if I can get an appointment. That's, that's kind of how it works, right? So using medical and, and a medical analogy, Jesus notes the important point. A person has to understand and acknowledge that he or she is a sinner before receiving the remedy, which Jesus alone can bring. These tax collectors who followed Jesus, they may not have looked like the spiritual people in the eyes of the Pharisees, but unlike those criticizing Jesus, the tax collectors at Levi's banquet, they all knew that they were sinners and Jesus could help them. Jesus rebelled against the cultural norms and viewpoints. He looked past the quick and often wrong judgments of those who were considered by, as society's outcasts. He showed radical acceptance to those who had been excluded by their culture. Instead of rejecting them and viewing them as enemies, Jesus showed us his intention for all people. He welcomes everyone to his table. Now, everyone has to make a choice if they want to go sit at that table. But he welcomes everyone to that table. The truth is, it's hard to reach a group for Jesus and despise them at the same time. The good news that Jesus came to bring is both inclusive and exclusive. It's inclusive because we all have access to it. The drug dealer, the politician, the the, uh, the polite person on your street, the pagan on your street, regardless of social standing or ethnicity or any other identifier that our modern world wants to put on someone, the gospel is good news to everyone, for everyone. It is, it is through the work of Jesus, the only begotten Son of God and what He did for us. That's the exclusiveness of the gospel. You can't get to Jesus. You can't get to the Father any other way. There isn't another way to get to heaven. It's not going to be at the end that God's going to say, you know what, don't worry about all this stuff. I just love you. Come on in. It doesn't work that way. As much as the world would love for us to think that, it works this way. I put my faith and trust in Jesus because he is the way. Some, in the name of loving people, accept anything and everything people do as if it somehow doesn't matter. But the truth is this. Jesus loves us, and he gave his life for us despite our sin. Not because of our sin is no big deal, but in spite of our sin. Because his love is so much vaster than our sin, 
so vast that he can turn a despised tax collector into the writer, a writer of the New Testament, and he can take any other sinner who will turn from their sin and trust in him and make something beautiful out of their life. It may not pastor a church. It may not be a missionary. That's not, that's not what I'm, we're talking about. We're just talking about something beautiful in our lives as we allow Jesus to work in us, as we trust in him. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this radical acceptance because it means that we can be accepted by you too. No matter what our past has been, no matter what we've done in the past, what we may be doing even today, your radical acceptance makes room for us. That we can know forgiveness of sin and the hope of the hope of salvation, the hope of eternity with you. God, help us to, to, to replicate that, that radical acceptance in our own lives. That we don't tag people and push them away because of whatever tag we've put on them, but see them as you see them. The potential that's there and the, and the desire you have for relationship that we can share that message with them. God, help us uh, to trust you, to trust you as, as Lord and Savior in every day, in every moment of our days. As you continue to pray just for a moment, let me, let me give us opportunities to respond this morning. And first of all, th those of us who are, we're already walking in faith with Jesus, but, but we maybe are struggling a bit with this radical acceptance business. It's good for Jesus, but I'm not there. But the Holy Spirit will be whispering to you this morning saying, I want you to be there. I want you to have that same radical acceptance. I want you to have that same willingness to, to go to whomever it is, you know, whatever they look like or act like, that you would go with them and share them with them my grace, my mercy, my love. And maybe the Spirit is bringing even somebody to your heart right now. You know that you got to have some radical acceptance with. And you'd slip up your hands, you know what, Pastor, I need, I need prayer because i got to respond to this. I, I need to, to begin to show that radical acceptance that Jesus showed me. Is that you this morning? Would you slip up your hands? Yeah, praise God. Jesus. Jesus. Lord, I pray for these that have raised hands across the room this morning, hearing your conviction, hearing your promptings, and that even in these moments, the Spirit is going to empower and encourage and enable them to say yes to those promptings and, and to display that same radical acceptance that Jesus displayed in all of these accounts and so many others. Where society can't see, you see. And we pray for your strength and encouragement, Lord, as we, as we follow your direction. And again, as we just pray for one, one, just one more moment, if you're not walking in relationship with the Lord today, you, you think, you know, I, I've just got so much baggage that he, he couldn't accept me. I would hope that in the course of these four accounts today that you realize that he's a rebel and he's going to accept you just the way you are. He won't leave you there. He's going to clean you up. He's going to change some things in your life, but he wants to accept you. And, and you have to just say, you know what, Jesus, I want forgiveness of sin. If that's you this morning, would you just slip up your hand and let me pray to you that, that you can receive that acceptance of Jesus today. Jesus. Jesus. Praise be to God. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you accept us. You, you call us by name. You get us. And as we, as we go from here today, as we go from here, uh, Lord, let us, let us see people as you see them. And respond to them as you would respond to them. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Well, we're going to, I'm just going to have you stand. And um, I'm not even going to try to lead us in a song this morning. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have Pastor Hank close us in prayer. And I'm going to greet you at the door with a Tootsie Roll here in a minute. Um, Friday night prayer time. Sign up to be a part of the Thanksgiving meal. Uh, if you need to be baptized, please talk to me. I would love to get you into that water and baptized and following Jesus at a greater level in your spiritual journey. Blessings.